Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev250 Advisory Group. And Rev250 is a collaboration among 70 groups in and around New England looking at the history of the American Revolution. And today, our guest is from the Commonwealth of Virginia, John Regasta, who is at the Robert Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, and is safe to say he is one of the premier scholars on the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, the author of two books on that subject, as well as uh, one book on Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry Proclaiming a Revolution, and now he's at work on another volume about Henry uh, one of these great figures in the American Revolution. So what drew you to Patrick Henry? John? Well, you know, it, it, people sometimes think we have this great research agenda. Uh, I find topics by serendipity. Um, and I came across doing some other research, a letter from George Washington to Patrick Henry in 1799, where George Washington is begging Patrick Henry to come back out of retirement to save the country because these selfish politicians were going to destroy the union um, with their effort at political partisanship. Well, who were these selfish politicians? Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. So here's George Washington and Patrick Henry against Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Fascinating story. So that's the story that, that I hope to tell in what I hope will be a forthcoming book next year. Now, you've also written about, you know, Henry's great introductory moment in American, the history of the revolution, his give me liberty or give me death speech. And do we know what exactly he said? No, <laughs> it's a simple answer. <laughs> uh, and his, you know, Patrick Henry spoke extemporaneously. And so people like Thomas Jefferson or even James Madison, who were not great speakers, would keep very meticulous notes or would write out their speech. Henry, who was this passionate speaker, but um, people would report his speeches. So a lot of them are recorded years afterwards. And people, including Thomas Jefferson, would say, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember every word of what he said. And so we don't have every word. We have a good idea of what he said. Yeah. And the, the most famous, give me liberty or give me death. Did he say that? Yes, of course he said that. People mm -hmm. remember that. It gets blazoned on people's shirts, you know. Um, so we don't know exactly what he said. Well, we have a pretty good idea. And, and part of that, by the way, a teaser for the new book, is Jefferson, who really dislikes Patrick Henry. Um, Henry dies in 1799. Jefferson dies in 1826. In those 27 intervening years, Jefferson takes every opportunity to destroy Patrick Henry's reputation. Um, wow. and, and so part of our lack of knowledge, the only thing we know about Patrick Henry is those seven words, give me liberty or give me death. Um, is really, we have to remember that people write history. It doesn't just happen, people mm -hmm. write history. And yeah. the history of Patrick Henry has been written very unfairly. Yeah. Not to belabor personalities, but why did Jefferson and Henry hate each other or dislike each other? <laughs> well, in many respects, they were very similar uh, politically. Uh, it, it dates back to 1781 when Jefferson is governor of Virginia, he's the second governor, Patrick Henry was the first. Um, the British invade and Bannister Tarleton, Bloody Tarleton, is chasing the Virginia government out of Richmond and then out of Charlottesville. Jefferson almost gets caught here at Monticello and runs away. Um, and the legislature, when they met in Stanton uh, across the mountains, um, Jefferson's disappeared because his term was up. And, and his term was up, but they had not elected a new governor. And he should have gone until they had a new governor. And so Jefferson's gone, and the legislature uh, launches an investigation of Jefferson's governorship, essentially accusing him of cowardice, incompetence, dishonor. And he's an 18th century gentleman. This, mm -hmm. you know, he, he tells James Monroe, this is an injury that will only be healed by the all-healing grave, which even for Jefferson, that's pretty yeah. serious. Um, and he blames Henry. Now, history is not perfectly clear that Henry is behind the investigation. Historians differ. I think Henry probably was behind the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, but that really launches, uh, after 1781, Jefferson, it, it, for the rest of his life, says terrible things about Patrick Henry. Wow. 
Now, of course, for us, the big story in this period in Virginia is the statute for religious freedom, which is, you know, Jefferson, it's one of the things on Jefferson's grave. And in your book, you really tell us the genesis of it is less with the mind of Jefferson and more with the dissenters in Virginia. Can you talk a little bit about these characters? Right. That's very important. And it's a point that, again, has been lost to history and, and somewhat intentionally that people didn't want it reported. We were taught that there's an established church in Virginia, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the official church. But a lot of the histories will say things like, well, it was a mild establishment. It, it wasn't particularly aggressive. That's not true. Um, in the 1760s, as the uh, dissenters, especially evangelical Baptists and Presbyterians, very religious people, start increasing in Virginia, the persecution and discrimination becomes very serious. Um, and, and I don't want to belabor it, but just to give an example, by the time of the American Revolution, over 50% of the Baptist ministers in Virginia, over half of the Baptist ministers in Virginia, had been jailed for preaching without a license or for disturbing the peace. So you have this very serious um, pro-Anglican, pro-Church of England system. You tax everybody. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian, Quaker, you pay a tax to be Anglican. Well, when the revolution hits, we need these people. Um, we especially need those Presbyterians out in the Shenandoah Valley who have rifles and can hit a squirrel at 100 yards. Uh, the riflemen at Saratoga are from Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. And Henry, who's the governor, actually talks about this with his um, his council and says, you know, we need those Presbyterians. They can shoot. Um, and so the, the, the dissenters, the Presbyterians and the Baptists basically insist you've got to get rid of this religious persecution if you want us to fight. And all through the war, there's this back and forth that the government gives them a little more freedom. It eliminates or it, it suspends. Initially, it suspends the tax that supports the Anglican Church and then it eliminates it. And. Um, you had to be married in the Anglican Church. If you were married by a Baptist minister, your children were bastards, You're not, which has legal implications. Um, so after the war, there's a question of what are we going to do in Virginia? And back to Henry, uh, Henry supports the idea of, well, we ought to have a tax to support religion because religion suffers during the war, often does. And let's have a tax, but we won't have a tax just to support Anglican ministers. We'll have a tax that will support all Christian ministers. Well, Jefferson and Madison oppose this, as do, and this is what's been forgotten, as do the evangelical Baptist and Presbyterians. They say, mm -hmm. no, uh, separation of church and state. Government has no business engaged in religion. And so that proposal to have a tax to support all Christian ministers gets thrown overboard and Jefferson's statute for establishing religious freedom is adopted. We're talking with John Rogoska, who is the author of Wellspring of Liberty, how Virginia's religious dissenters helped to win the American Revolution and secure religious liberty, as well as religious freedom, Jefferson's legacy, America's creed. And you came at this, actually, it's a fascinating thing because you have this Anglican establishment in your book, you show how much of an establishment they were. They weren't tottering and many of them are part of the Patriot cause. And then you have a minority, a religious, religious minority. So how does the religious minority convince the majority of this? That's a fascinating thing. Well, you know, uh, wars uh, are, are terrible, uh, but they create opportunities for change. Mm -hmm. And the Baptists and the Presbyterians, again, the, the very religious people, evangelicals, um, they realize very early on. And so they write these petitions. It's, it's fascinating. In, before the war, in 1772, 1774, they're writing these petitions to the government that basically says, just please stop throwing us in jail. Please stop persecuting us. We're even willing to pay the tax for the Anglican ministers, but just stop throwing us in jail. Mm -hmm. By 1775, once the shooting starts in 1776, they're writing petitions that start to list, you know, you, you tax us to pay different ministers. You don't allow us to marry. You, when a, uh, if you're a Baptist or Presbyterian and you die and you have orphaned children, they'll get sent to an Anglican home because the Anglican mm -hmm. vestry controls that issue as well. They say, you know, you're sending our children to these homes. Please stop doing these things. And then they'd say things like, 
these things granted, this being done, we will always support the cause of liberty. And when you, when you read, the Anglicans respond and they say, we know what they're doing. They're, they're trying to hold you up. They're blackmailing you, saying they're not going to support the war if you don't give them a religious liberty. And the answer is, yeah, that's exactly what they were doing. Um, and it works. Um, it, until, as I said, after the war, it's still a little bit up in, up in the air as to what's going to happen. And, you know, uh, you have this uh, phenomenal alliance of these Enlightenment thinkers, Jefferson and Madison, mm -hmm. with these evangelicals saying government needs to get out of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, we want a separation of church and state and we want real religious freedom. And then that becomes the genesis of the First Amendment. Right. So uh, and, and it's important to remember that Rhode Island, I think, was the only state that didn't have a religious test for people to hold office. You know, in Connecticut, you had to profess a belief not only in Christ, the Christian, in, in the Trinity. And right. so so how radical a step is this for what Virginia and Rhode Island do? Well, it, it is radical. And Rhode Island still has something in their charter, as I recall, that talks about, the, you know, this is a Christian commonwealth or something like that. But your, your point is exactly the point that Justice Rehnquist made. And we were talking earlier about how, you, how do you get into this research. The, the second book on Jefferson and religious freedom developed because of Justice Rehnquist's dissent in Wallace versus Jaffrey, which is the moment of silence case. And Rehnquist uh, basically says, why Jefferson? You know, why, why do we keep looking at Jefferson for, for religious freedom? Why don't we look at what Pennsylvania said or New York said, where they required you to believe in the Trinity? They required you to believe in, in both uh, books of the Bible. Um, and I thought that was a fair question. Now, I think his answer was very ill-informed. Um, but And I asked myself the same way I would ask students, how do we know? You know, how, how do we know in early America what they thought religious freedom meant? Did they think it meant a Jeffersonian separation of church and state? Or were they thinking along the lines of New Jersey, Maryland? They all had these provisions saying, well, Christians can, can hold mm -hmm. off. Christians can vote. You have to believe in the Old and the New Testament. Um, and so I started looking in, into that and I asked myself, well, what would you look at? And the first thing I looked at is what you mentioned. I looked at all of these state constitutions. And, um, but here's what we don't remember. Those state constitutions all change. You know, the US Constitution was drafted in 1787 and it's basically the same as it was in 1787. States have constitutional conventions all the time. Right. So I looked at every one of the state constitutions in that period and they all change and they all change dramatically on the issue of religious freedom. And they all change in a Jeffersonian direction. They all adopt separation of church and state. At the constitutional conventions, they talk about, remember what Jefferson said in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Rhode Island takes language out of the Virginia statute and just incorporates that language into its own constitutional provision. Mm -hmm. and, and so you see all of this happening. Um, and then I asked, okay, well, what else would we look at? So I looked at newspapers and I find mm -hmm. Scores, scores of newspapers quoting at length, and, and the Virginia statute's a long document, uh, and Madison's memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments, against religious taxes, long document. They'd reprint it on the front page of the newspaper when there was a local debate about short state issues. And they'd say, remember what the great Madison said, remember what the great Jefferson said. Scores of these. And nobody else, nobody's quoting right. Alexander Hamilton or John Adams or no. a little bit of George Washington. So I said, okay, well, what are the history said? I start looking at the early 19th century history. Mm -hmm. uh, how, um, the, you know, the um, Bancroft, they all say, mm -hmm. oh no, American religious freedom, Thomas Jefferson. So by 1879, in the first Supreme Court case, uh, Reynolds versus United States, first Supreme Court case on religious freedom, the court unanimously says, if you want to understand the First Amendment, if you want to understand American religious freedom, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the letter to the Danbury Baptist talking about a wall of separation, that's what the First Amendment means. So, you know, I think Rehnquist asks a good question, why Jefferson? But then he ignores all of the evidence that says, well, that's because that's what they understood religious freedom to mean. Right. right. Now, at, uh, at Monticello, you also maintain a website of documents on Jefferson and religious liberty, which is 
a great thing. Can you tell us a little bit about what someone who goes to your website is going to find? Well, it, it, Monticello, of course, is a wonderful institution, um, yes. it, it, partially because we have, and, and you know, a lot of history institutions are having a great deal of difficulty, these small museums. Mm -hmm. um, Monticello, Mount Vernon have resources because of mm -hmm. Jefferson, because of Washington. And so we have the wherewithal to have people like me who spend their days mm -hmm. researching early America. And we keep material on our website on, uh, we have what's referred to as the Jefferson Encyclopedia. And so almost any topic in early America uh, that touches on Jefferson and almost everything touches on Jefferson, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's going to be an entry for that. Um, and then we also do a lot of programs like this. We put up a lot of live streams on uh, religious freedom. We did one, uh, we've done several earlier this year, uh, did one earlier this year on Jefferson and Patrick Henry. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be at an institution that has those resources, but I'm, I'm always very sympathetic to the um, in places like Red Hill, Patrick Henry's right. home. They just don't have those kinds of resources. Right. A tremendous place. So, I mean, you went to UVA Law School and then you got your PhD at UVA. So you've been in Jefferson's shadow for uh, much of your, uh, did you anticipate when you were getting your PhD that you're going to be winding up at Monticello? I mean, what a special thing that would be. Well, it is, it's, it, it, but the answer is no. I remember when I moved to Charlottesville, I actually transferred to UVA Law School. Um, and I, I came to Charlottesville, I'd never been here. And I uh, came to law school, I uh, was newly married. And people would tell me, you know, in Charlottesville, you have to understand people talk as if Thomas Jefferson's in the next room, like he's still here. And I thought, oh, that's weird. And it is, it's weird and people do it. It's, it's like Jefferson is this omnipresent uh, person. Um, you know, so, and then I came back, I practiced law for many years, as you know, for about 20 years and then came back here for my PhD. Um, but Jefferson, and, and we're going through this renaissance of Jefferson, and for that matter, all the founders of, of appreciating what they did as well as the flaws. And Jefferson mm -hmm. has deep and serious flaws. I mean, he enslaved over 600 individuals. He enslaved his own children. Um, so, and I, we are now grappling with that. Mm -hmm. uh, now I have no problems. I, you know, I, I always distinguish say a Jefferson from a Robert E. Lee or a Stonewall Jackson. The only reason anybody remembers Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson is because they fought in a traitorous war to protect slavery. That's why those statues are there. Um, we remember Jefferson and Washington and Madison, all slaveholders, Patrick Henry, for other reasons, because they really contributed to what we want America to be. I mean, Jefferson speaks better than anyone of what America can be and should be. And he recognizes it. He says, you, you had mentioned his tombstone. Jefferson's tombstone says, I want to be remembered for three things. Declaration of Independence, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and UVA. Political freedom, religious freedom, and public education. And in his later year, years, he talks about we haven't reached those goals. He knows we haven't lived by those principles, but he says we're striving in that direction. Uh, all, uh, all men are awakening to the, what the declaration holds. And, and so this recognition that they were stating principles that they failed to abide by, we don't abide by them as we continue to struggle. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, being in a place right now at this, this moment of uh, rethinking the founders is important. Um, and I think that Jefferson, Washington, they have important lessons to teach us. We must recognize their enormous failings. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I mean, you, it's not fair to talk about Jefferson without recognizing, you know, he, he enslaves people. Um, and, and he knows it. People say, well, that was, you know, that was the 18th century. They knew it was wrong. Jefferson oh, yeah. knew it was wrong. I mean, he says that. He says it's an abomination. It must stop. God can't side with us um, in this dispute. Mm -hmm. We're talking with John Ragosta from the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello and the author of a couple of books about Jefferson and religious liberty and one book and another in press about Patrick Henry. And just talking about the complicated legacies of these guys. I remember a couple of weeks ago, we spoke to someone from the Adams site in Quincy and 
Um, Adams and Jefferson have an interesting relationship. And recognizing each other's shortcomings, too, which is... Well, and one of the wonderful things about Adams and Jefferson, I keep, I tell people, I want to teach a class where all we do is we read Jefferson's and Adams' letters. There's a two-volume yeah. edition, uh, fabulous letters. You, you, you know, if you want to read what's going on in early America, read that exchange over the course of 50 years between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Um, and of course, they work very closely together in the Second Continental Congress on the Declaration on Independence. They have a falling out over politics, um, somewhat over personalities. We tend to forget, mm -hmm. we, think of, the, 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 we think of these guys in marble, like marble statues, yeah. they're real people, they're politicians. Um, but they later in life um, are brought back together by Benjamin Rush and then have this, this wonderful exchange. Um, and they're also very interesting on religion. You know, the John Adams, the, the great election of 1800, which we, mm -hmm. we talk about because the first contested election where we have a change of power, peaceful, uh, we used to think that was a given that we would have peaceful change right. of power. Um, first peaceful change of power between different political parties. Um, Adams tells Jefferson later in life when, they, when they're communicating again, he said, well, you know why I lost that election? And he said, it was because of church state. He said that people mm -hmm. thought I was mixing religion with the government and, you know, your stand against uh, mm -hmm. state relations is really why you won that election, which is interesting because at the time in 1800, there was this whole group of New England clergy who were saying, right. if Jefferson elects, you know, is elected, they're going to burn Bibles, your daughters, right. oh, yeah. you know, um, and, and so it's fascinating, you know, in that exchange between Jefferson and Adams, they talk about that election. And Adam says, yeah, those guys were all wrong. Um, it's because people were afraid that I was going to use the government to promote religion um, mm -hmm. is why I lost that election. Yeah. And then in 1820 at the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention, it's really Matt Adams who pushes the separation of church and state in Massachusetts. You know, we had a congregational church established here and he is, you know, the voice for disestablishment as right. in 1774 when a, a Baptist minister showed up at the Continental Congress and uh, con yeah, Congress said, you know, complaining about taxation without representation. Right. Uh, you know, Massachusetts. Yeah, Bacchus, Isaac Bacchus shows up and Isaac yeah. Bacchus and John Leland and, you, you know, yeah. um, and so, you know, Massachusetts becomes the final state to eliminate, eliminate a church establishment in 1833. And it's fascinating. And this it goes back to Rehnquist. Rehnquist and Berger, a lot of, and, and currently it was, it was Scalia did, um, you know, that, that um, the conservative justices now love to quote Justice uh, Joseph Story, who was a great mm -hmm. constitutional yeah, yeah. scholar, Justice Story, early 19th century. And Justice Story, however, was very conservative on religion. And so he wrote um, in his book on the commentaries on the Constitution that religious freedom is not intended to be a separation of church and state. It's intended to ensure that no one church controls the national government. It can't mm -hmm. be Presbyterian. It can't be Methodist. It can't be Baptist. And, and that's what Story says. Story writes that in Commentaries on the Constitution the same year that the people of Massachusetts, by a vote of nine to one, are voting against exactly that theory that you could have, you know, because mm -hmm. by that point, Massachusetts had a multiple establishment. Uh, there was no yeah. one established church. It was each each community could choose its own church. Um, and, and that's rejected by a vote of nine to one. Uh, and But Rehnquist and, 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 as I said, Scalia and Thomas, and, um, now Alito, they latch on to that Joseph story and ignore that he's not a founder. He was like nine years old when the Constitution's mm -hmm. drafted. Uh, and ignoring all of this history of no, at the time it was Jefferson and Madison um, and that's what the state constitution said. That's what the newspaper said. That's what the history said. Um, you know, again, apropos of our time, I found, as I was doing this research, I found a couple of travel pamphlets from that, that in the early 19th century, um, American states wanted immigrants. We have a hard time. Mm -hmm. and, and so they would write these pamphlets that they would have distributed in Europe, trying to convince people to emigrate to the United States. And there was one from Kentucky and it, featured the idea that if you come to America, you can come to America for religious freedom. And if you want to know what American religious freedom is, they reprinted Jefferson's statute for establishing religious freedom. Now, this is Kentucky. 
but they mm. reprint Jefferson's statute and said that's American, you know, religious freedom, separation of church and state. Um, so, you know, the, 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 these developments, um, we, we tend to think of that. It's oftentimes, again, some of the conservative justices will say, well, that's a modern uh, a 20th century. Well, no, that was not a 20th century idea. That was that was a 19th century idea. And, yeah, you know, you mentioned Isaac Bacchus, the, the Baptist minister of Combs. I mentioned John Leland. One of the things we also forget is why are these evangelicals, these deeply religious people supporting separation of church and state? We tend to think of separation of church and state in a Jeffersonian view, philosophically, enlightenment, freedom of the human mind. Politically, we had to end persecution because Jefferson talks about oceans of blood have been spilled. And we saw it in Virginia. People were fighting. People were going to jail. You can't have Jefferson in his famous quote talks about the statute is for the Jew and the Christian or uh, uh, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu and the infidel of every nation. Well, we don't have a lot of Hindus in 18th century Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. but he's saying this is for everybody and we will. We will have Muslims, we will have Hindus, we will have people of every denomination. So politically, if we're going to have a multi-ethnic, a multi-national nation, e pluribus unum, out of many one, we have to have religious freedom. People forget the third leg, which is theological. These Baptists and Presbyterians, and John Leland, uh, the great Baptist minister from 18th century Virginia, says, look, um, if the government, and you have to think about this for He says, if the government can come with me to the judgment seat when I die and I stand before my maker, if the government can come with me and defend me at the judgment seat, then the government can deal with religion. If they don't come with me when I meet my maker, then government has to stay out because my religion must be a relationship between me and my God. And, and no one can interfere because if anyone interferes, you know, that, that destroys religion, which is a personal thing. So there's this, uh, it's really a three-legged stool. There's, there's mm -hmm. the philosophical, there's the political, and there is a theological basis uh, for, for this idea of, you know, the free will. If you're going to have a free will, you can't have the government putting a gun to your head and telling you what religion to have. You can't have the government saying, we'll pay you if you take our religion. Mm -hmm. The government has to stay out. Yeah. Thank you. We're talking with John Rogoska from the Robert Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. And... We have a lot more we could talk about over the next, uh, I wish we had uh, a couple of hours for this discussion, um, and particularly as the whole idea of separation of church and state. You know, all these, they wanted a moral foundation for society, yeah, a sure. virtuous society. How do you go about creating that you know, without an established church? And they show that you can do this. Um, but I want to talk about something a little bit different, which really comes out of much of the work you have done is getting things out of sources that we didn't know were there. And the, actually, in a curious way, the Internet makes it easier to get things. You, know, you have a wonderful essay you wrote on Patrick Henry's If This Be Treason speech and the things you can find through a newspaper search. And yeah. so it's a wealth of stuff that's now available to us. The databases, I, I mean, it's almost embarrassing how, how rarely you have to actually go into an archive and get dusty and pull out the old microfilms. Um, the databases are phenomenal. That One of the difficulties, of course, is many of the databases are behind paywalls. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why academics, um, for many years, I, I've been working here at Monticello for the last three years. For many years before that, I was a fellow and I continue to be a fellow at Virginia Humanities. Uh, which is sort of a subsidiary of the University of Virginia, which gives me access to those databases. Um, but it is astounding. And, and the newspapers, I, when I talk to students, you know, they're going to find things that you just couldn't find 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and so, for example, when I was talking about, um, you know, what I did with this question that Rehnquist way, raises of why Jefferson, being able to go to those newspaper databases and you type in religious freedom, church, state, and, and, and hundreds of articles come out and you spend your time reading through them. Um, but the resources we have are extraordinary and, and people are going to do research that, that wasn't available. I, I don't want to, by the way, let your, your point go with Obama. On, um, yes, the Jefferson and Matthew, they all believed you had to have virtuous leaders. Mm -hmm. 
they just believed the government didn't need to mandate religion, but, but they really felt, um, all of the early founders, you find them talking about that, that it's critically important that our leaders be honest, be virtuous, be publicly minded. Um, you know, that was central to their understanding. Yes, it was. It really was. So thank you. We've been talking with John Ragosta from the Robert Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Is there anything you would like to add before we? No, you know, we're covering an awful lot of territory. Hopefully we can come back someday and talk about Patrick Henry more. But, but no, this is, it, it, you know, I mentioned that to some extent this story got forgotten, the story of separation of church and state. Yes. And, and why, it, I'll mention why it got forgotten. And, and there's letters, we can, we can show this. After the war was over, after the Revolutionary War is over, everybody has to say, we were patriots. We supported the mm -hmm. war. And so people started saying in the 1780s and the 1790s, well, to the Presbyterians and Baptists, well, wait a minute. Didn't you blackmail us? Didn't you say you wouldn't support the war unless you got religious freedom? And so the Baptists and the Presbyterians suppressed that evidence because they wanted to be known as great That's patriots. Right. And, and so this is, and this relates to your point about sources, when this is why we have historians that if you really dig into the material and you get those primary sources and you get those letters and you get those petitions, um, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, history happens, but history is also written. Um, and, and so we need to be cognizant of that. We do. So thank you, John Ragosta from the Robert Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. I think this will be John Ragosta episode one. We'll have you back and now we'll be piped off on the road to Boston. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Bob.